I'm co-hosting this with my <laughs> parliamentary friend, uh, my colleague Glenn Davis, who is here. Um, he will uh, he's the, has a role within the all-party parliamentary group for arrhythmias, and he is going to take over from me now and uh, deal with, with the introductions. Thank you very much, Mike. And uh, there, I mean, there's two reasons why I'm here. One, one of course, is to um, emphasise the importance of Heart Rhythm Week. World Heart Rhythm Week, and um, indeed to talk a little bit of, uh, about the um, raising the awareness of uh, of arrhythmias. And the second reason is that it's about the only place in Parliament where I can get away from Conservative MPs who are seeking the leadership. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, accosted in every corner, and I can't actually see one of them here. If they knew, if, I, if they knew I was here, we'd have a bigger crowd. Um, <laughs> I think the, the whole issue of arrhythmias, I mean, I was uh, involved in the, an arrhythmia myself many years ago, and, I, uh, and like an awful lot of people, I didn't know about it. I didn't realize how significant it was. And then I um, developed an interest, obviously, from a personal experience. And then I met Trudy Loban, who is a, and she's, she's a brute, really. She's, she's here, and, and if, if Trudy says you do something, you have to do it, and that, that's that's the rule. And ever since then, I've been doing it in the, the atrial fibrillation group, and now in the arrhythmia group with Mike. And um, it's a no-brainer. I mean, we do what we can to raise awareness in Parliament. I think it's been very successful. And I think the building itself is a um, something that we can use. It's an iconic building, and having an event here in itself encourages a lot of people uh, to come. I, I think it's brilliant. I've been a member of Parliament. Not for as long as Mike, I don't think. I'm not sure how long you've been a member of Mike. 27. 27. Mike's been 27. Well, I've only been here a mere nine. But it's, um, it's still, I still think it's one of the most wonderful places for you to hold a meeting and to engage with the public here. Uh, people just love to come. And um, that's why, that's why I, the, these events, I think, are, are very, very successful. And we've got a whole range of speakers. Now, you don't want to hear from politicians there, and, and all I was intending to do is to, to read out the, the speakers in their turn, and they can come up in turn, and they can introduce themselves rather than have me step in at the various stages. We have, and if I have anybody, the pronunciation of anybody's name wrong, I, I apologize. Um, it, it, we, we start with <coughs> Helen Williams is speaking, then Eniola Oladipa, and then we have Professor John Camp, who's been here many times before. I can't go see John at the moment, but there he is, yeah. And it's it, it always, always very informative and always absolutely worth listening to. And then we have um, Sotiris Antonio and Professor Filippa Alves da Costa. And then, um, I, I, just come up in turn and introduce yourself, and then I, I, then I won't step in, and we can just spend as much of the time as we can listening to the experts. So, Helen first. Thank you very much. You may think I don't look very much like Huon Gray, and you'd be correct. I'm afraid uh, you're, you're stuck with me today. Uh, my name's Ella Williams, I'm a pharmacist by background. I'm also the National Clinical Advisor to the Academic Health Science Network AF programme across England, uh, which I think is why I've been asked to speak today. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the implications of the long-term plan. So the strap line for the long-term plan is really to prevent 150,000 heart attack strokes and dementia cases um, and better access to mental health services for adults and children. So there are a number of elements that we need, obviously, to be able to deliver better care for patients. Some of them are much more about the system, which I'll talk a little bit about in brief at the beginning, and then really focus down on the issues we need to highlight for cardiovascular care, and in particular, arrhythmia and AF. So one of the main aims is to deliver a 21st century service model trying to improve the care for patients out of hospital, reducing the pressure that we see day in, day out on our emergency care, empowering the people of England to look after themselves and to uh, self-care where they can and to know where they can actually access better care, which services they should seek help from for different conditions. We also obviously need better digital care, both in primary care and in the outpatient setting, and a focus too on managing the, po the health of our, our population. So really key to doing all this is our workforce, the workforce that delivers the care for all those patients that we see day to day. Um, the aim is to develop an implementation plan to deliver a 21st century workforce, trying to increase the number of nurses, midwives, allied health professionals and other staff, and obviously building up our medical profession as well. 
International recruitment is one aim, but we want to encourage our local population to want to work within our NHS system and support our current staff so that they stay in the system and we don't lose them to other professions and, and, uh, and other exciting careers they may wish to follow. Try to be as productive as we can. I think we do have an efficient NHS despite what we sometimes see in the media and also work on developing leadership and talent within our NHS to help them and to help the staff themselves to lead effectively. We also rely on volunteers and I'm sure there are volunteers around this room today who help support the NHS in delivery and we want to recruit more volunteers to make the best of their skills um, in order to improve our patient care. Digital is a key focus. One of the issues we always have in the NHS is how much do we invest in new technologies while we're still trying to deliver some of the basics. We need to upskill our staff and our population as well to manage digital um, health apps etc and new tools to support better care. Uh, we have great data in the NHS or great information but sometimes we're not good at making the uh, turning the data into a story that helps us work out where we should best invest and we also have the opportunity to use digital innovation to, uh, to improve clinical efficiency and safety. One of the other aims that it focuses on is maximising our taxpayer investment so that we get the best out of the money that we invest in our staff and in our patient care to deliver um, consistent care to patients across the whole of England and to see the transformation towards this 20, 21st century service. So key for cardiovascular care, there are really two key elements of the long-term plan. One is focusing on prevention and inequalities and looking at those upstream um, issues that impact on the patient experience and the uh, occurrence of cardiovascular disease. So smoking, how can we encourage smoking cessation, managing the obesity that we see within our population, moderating alcohol take, intake, dealing with air pollution, which is actually a key element of cardiovascular disease as a risk factor. Other areas like antimicrobial resistant, very important. And all the programmes that NHS England are proposing to investment, invest in now, uh, looking to address health inequalities within the population. So moving on to the quality of care and the outcomes, cardiovascular disease is a core element of this uh, chapter for the um, long-term plan. We know that cardiovascular disease is responsible for about a quarter of all deaths in the UK. <laughs> and is certainly the largest cause of premature mortality in our deprived areas within the country. It's the single biggest area where the NHS can save lives over the next 10 years, and much of it is preventable. Uh, the prevention chapter's already highlighted issues around public health, smoking, tobacco addiction, obesity, alcohol, and looking at food and uh, public health issues around the food that we eat and the way it's marketed to us uh, we've seen a change for smoking where they changed to um, unbranded cigarette packages and I saw at the weekend they were talking about well should we be doing the same for food you don't get branded vegetables which is probably why we don't buy them so maybe we need to brand the vegetables or minimize the branding on some of these uh, more toxic dietary processed foods that we like buying early detection and treatment is an important element so that people can live longer healthier lives we know that many people live with undetected high-risk conditions and, and in the plan it talks about the ABC of cardiovascular disease. Atrial fibrillation, which we all know about here, uh, high blood pressure and high cholesterol. And in fact, these conditions don't exist in isolation. Most patients will have one, two or three and we need to look at them as a, as a, a group rather than focus on, on the single conditions. Many countries have made uh, good progress by focusing on these um, ABCs and if we can replicate this approach in England, uh, utilising digital technology where appropriate, we could really help to deliver better outcomes for patients, working with the voluntary sector, with employers, with the public sector and also the NHS. One of the things that I've been involved in recently through the Academic Health Science Networks is the rollout of single lead ECG devices. Many of you may have seen them, there may be some here today, uh, where you literally can put your fingers on a, on a device that attaches to your mobile phone and record an ECG and it will interpret it for you. We've uh, rolled out 6,000 of these across England and we're just uh, in the process of completing an evaluation. 
But there are other ways without the tech that people can detect AF. Simple fingers on pulses. So we need to raise awareness with the, uh, with the population, with the general public about how AF can be detected without fancy gadgets. Although I suspect all of these fancy watches we have now, Fitbits, Apple watches, will also help with detection in our general population. And the AFA really has driven many awareness events across England that the HSNs have also been working with and probably many of you um, here. We do some, have some issues with the detection policy at the moment. So we have some problems with alignment. At, at the moment, the National Steering Committee uh, for the UK do not recommend routine screening for people over 65s who are not uh, who, uh, for the identification of AF. However, NHS England have commissioned the HSNs to roll out detection devices and NICE has just not recommended for routine use some of these uh, single lead ECG devices. It's hard to see how as a nation we can achieve the ambition of identifying 85% of our AF without being allowed to go out and screen. So there is a definite uh, misalignment real, really there uh, of policy and an urgent need and I know we're going to hear more about that from Professor Cam shortly. So aside from detection, important that we think about the effectiveness of our treatment approaches. Um, identifying people with high risk conditions on its own is not going to improve their outcomes. We need to make sure that they then progress through the pathway to get the right diagnoses and then the right treatment. We also need to give people opportunity to test their own health, blood pressure checks, AF screens in other settings, um, mobilising our community to do some of this work for themselves and really giving people the power, empowering them to feel engaged in their healthcare. We're looking to expand the access to genetic testing for people with uh, potential familial hypercholesterolemia. And the long-term plan did talk about ex extra pharmacists and nurses and other allied health professionals to detect and manage these high-risk conditions. And one of the most important elements, I think, is a national CVD prevention audit uh, for primary care that will allow us to see how well we're doing, how much progress is being made, in a more real-time way, because at the moment we rely mainly on annual cloth data. This, we hope, will be quarterly data, will allow us in year to make changes to our um, management plans and our strategies. One of the big um, investments that NHS England have made as a result of the long-term plan is a £9 million pound, pound program um, to improve the treatment of AF through the rollout of a model called Virtual Clinics, which we um, implemented in local CCGs just across the river, Lambeth and Southwark CCG. In Lambeth and Southwark, we reviewed every single AF patient that was not anticoagulated systematically. And at the end of the year, we treated another 1,200 patients with anticoagulant therapy. And um, in that year, we saw a 25% reduction in AF-related stroke. So this new funded programme will, will review over 18,000 patients across 23 CCGs in England as a demonstrator project to see if this investment will uh, translate into more people treated. And obviously, what we really hope is a reduction in AF-related stroke. So aligned to the long-term plan, the AF national ambitions are to find 85% of our AF patients by 2029 and to treat 90% of our AF patients at risk of stroke with anticoag therapy by 2029. Where are we now? You might ask, well, we've actually seen really great progress. Based on our Public Health England modelling, we think that 79% of patients with AF have been detected. I have to say, I think the modelling may underestimate and we might find we still have a bigger gap than that, but we're certainly a lot better than we were. And we think as academic health science networks working across the system in England, we will deliver 85% actually by March 2020, so some nine years before the ambition in the long-term plan. We're also treating now 84% of patients with AF at risk of stroke with anticoagulant therapy. So aiming to get this, in, with the HSNs we're aiming to get everyone above the 84% uh, de uh, baseline, but the national aim is to get people to 90%. Uh, and as a result of this work, we've actually seen a fall in AF related strokes since 2015 16, a small fall at the moment, but at the time the data <coughs> lags behind. So we hope by March 2020 we'll see um, a significant fall. We do need to do more work. 
We need to make sure the patient pathway is optimised. Many of our patients say it sometimes takes them a long time to get diagnosed and treated. So we need to focus on that element of treatment. Support our patients to take their therapy uh, effectively, what we call adherence, because you don't get uh, protection from stroke if you don't take your anticoagulant therapy regularly. We need to look at the ABCs holistically, not as individual elements of care. Upskill the workforce, which is expanding all the time and try to make sure we don't end up with fragmentation with the newly formed uh, primary care networks that are um, being implemented across England. So thank you for your attention. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm very pleased to be able to talk to you for a brief moment this afternoon about uh, what we've been calling AF. Now, AF is easy to say. It stands for atrial fibrillation. Now, it all sounds a bit dry, and I think a lot of the administrative and progressive developments in this area also seem a bit dry. But let me just remind you that looking at this room of people, one out of four, probably one out of two of you, will eventually have atrial fibrillation. So that should bring it home to you that this is an important issue. To discuss. Now, I know there are many people in this room who've got atrial fibrillation, so maybe your chances are not as high as one in two or one in four, but it is a major problem. Now, I want to ask a few questions. Why should we screen for atrial fibrillation? Well, it's really simple. Atrial fibrillation is common. It's about 10% uh, of everybody over the age of 70. 20% of everybody over the age of 80. Nearly 50% for people who are 100 or more. So it's common. It's associated with stroke. Five times the likelihood of stroke. Two times the likelihood of sudden death. Two times the likelihood of all-cause mortality. Three times the likelihood of hospitalization. Three times the likelihood of dementia. Do we need any more to say that it's an important problem? Now, how do we diagnose it? We take the pulse. Doctors have been able to do that for some years. It was regarded as a new fangled scientific approach in about 1750. <laughs> but nowadays it's recognized a fairly simple thing to do. So we can take the pulse, and if it is irregular, we can record an ECG. Now that is the proposal for screening. There are two forms of screening. One is called opportunistic screening. You take the opportunity when you see a patient of feeling the pulse, and then following through with an ECG. The other form is called systematic screening. You take a patient with various characteristics, it might be that they're 65 or 75, it might mean that they have heart failure or they have coronary disease, and you take their pulse and take their ECG systematically. Now, the screening committee, the National Screening Committee in the UK argues that we don't have the case yet for doing this. And I have a lot of sympathy with what they say, but I believe that they are missing the point. The point is, it's pretty easy to identify atrial fibrillation, and it is, in principle, easy to treat. The majority of patients need only to take an anticoagulant <coughs> on a regular basis, and their likelihood that they will have a stroke will drop by between 65 and 75% their likelihood of an early death will drop by 33%. So this is a very simple, iterative process. Find the atrial fibrillation, prescribe the drug, take it, and you'll have a much better chance of surviving, and surviving without a stroke. Now, what's the argument against doing this? Well, you have to ask, is it going to be cost-effective? Well, we've already had an HTA report from NICE. Trudy, you were one of the authors that said 
that, yes, it's highly likely to be cost-effective. But the National Screening Committee still want more evidence about that, but they're quite cheerful about potential cost-effectiveness. But they say, now, you doctors, you don't prescribe anticoagulants to all of those patients who should have them. So what's the point of finding you some more patients so that you don't prescribe the medicines as you should? And they also say, you patients, you don't take the damn medicines. What's the point in prescribing them? If you put them in the bathroom cupboard, if you flush them down the loo, if you throw them into the dustbin. I have a patient from South London whose job was to go and collect unused medicines that have been returned to the pharmacy. He collects two metric tons every year of unused medicine. Now, this is one of the biggest scandals we have in medicine. Almost half our drug bill is wasted, prescribed and not taken. So, the screening committee has a point. We do have to follow through by prescribing and then taking medications and, in part, contributing to making sure that we keep ourselves well. Now, what's going on at the moment? Well, we're trying to meet the requirements of the screening committee in the UK and, for example, the US Preventive Service in the United States of America. The US Preventive Service have added another big question mark. They'll say, well, you can record an ECG, but that is not hazard-free. Really? Well, we all know we can record an ECG, and I haven't seen anybody drop down dead just because it's being recorded. But they point out that, well, you might find something which in the end of the day is nothing. You will have worried patients. You may have over-investigated the patients. Now, if you over-investigate them because you find something on the ECG other than atrial fibrillation, that seems to me to be an added bonus. But if you do investigate patients needlessly, I agree that would be a downside. Now, the National Screening Committee just want one simple bit of information want to take one group of patients, screen them for atrial fibrillation, and another group of patients, same time period, from the same localities, don't screen them for atrial fibrillation, follow both groups for five or ten years, and find out whether the screened group do better than the unscreened group. They point out that we don't really know the hazard of a minute or two of atrial fibrillation. They point out that not all atrial fibrillation is there every time you try and take the pulse. So there are some good questions, and there are some straightforward ways of answering them, but it takes money, effort, and time. Now, fortunately, there are two big studies going on in the world today doing just what the National Screening Committee want. One is in Sweden, called the Stroke Stop Study, and the other is here in the United Kingdom called the SAFER study. It's being done from Cambridge University, Professor Jonathan Mant. They're taking 120,000 patients, 40,000 will be screened, 80,000 will not be screened. They come from about 300 GP practices, and then they're following them to see how they do. And if the screen population do well, you can calculate how much it costs, what you save, and what uh, diseases and problems and ill health you prevent it. Unfortunately, time is not on our side. That will take a good long time to really find the answer. But we are being overtaken, for goodness sake. There are so many other ways of screening for atrial fibrillation. I know I've seen several of you wearing Apple Watches, for example, today. I've seen exhibitors with the uh, LiveCore device. There are many gadgets that are now available that will tell you that you have an irregular pulse. Some of them will record the ECG there and then. It will encourage you to tell your doctor to send the recording 
to the doctor. And the doctor will be encouraged, we hope, to respond. But the problem with many of these devices is that we are absolutely deluged by the information. I have one patient who sends me a live call recording, gentlemen, sends me a live call recording, 24 of them every day of his life. I have other patients who come to the clinic with ring binders. They come in with a host of ring binders maybe five or six hundred pages of ECG, and I have to look at these in the ten-minute period of time that I have to deal with these patients. So I do the old cinematographic tri trick, card trick. I just flip them over and see if I spot anything as they go by. <laughs> but uh, we obviously have a problem with how we're going to handle all of these data. And, but that is also being addressed. But as you know, there are many, many sophisticated ways that we are going to be able to do this. Let me remind you that if you look at your phone, the camera in your phone can look at you. And as it looks at you, it can see the pulsing in your face. It can see the pulsing in your iris. It can see the pulsing in your retina. It can tell straight away that you have atrial fibrillation. And what is more, if you just talk, the heartbeat modulates everything you say. So as I speak to you, there's a device, in this case called CardioCol, that can detect atrial fibrillation from my voice. So you've seen the strap line for today. We hear you. We hear atrial fibrillation. Thank you very much. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Philippa Costa. I'm a pharmacist from Portugal. And I have a shared presentation with my colleague, Sotiri Antonio, who is a pharmacist here in the UK. And we're here to represent the IPAC group, which is the International Pharmacists Association for Anticoagulation Care Task Force. And this is quite a recent network that was created in the end of 2015. Um, and it has evolved progressively to now include 25 countries uh, across the five continents of the world. Um, so the interest um, in this organization is that can be helpful to some of the problems that have been already r risen here. Uh, so our organization does not only include uh, clinical pharmacists with advanced skills in cardiovascular medicine, but we also have uh, researchers, academics, um, and also policymakers. Um, so when we started, we started by looking at the good practice examples all over the world. And of course, we recognize the UK as one lead example in the, with the long experience in Know Your Pulse campaigns uh, led by the Arrhythmia Alliance. And we uh, also were, were aware that in some countries there were already initiatives being uh, conducted in pharmacy. Um, where pharmacists were used as partners, as collaborators for a higher uptake of un unidentified AF. So we wanted to replicate this uh, opportunity, the, the, these events all over the world and see uh, the, difficult, the difficulties associated. So of course we know that the healthcare systems vary a lot across the globe, and, um, but they have all one characteristic in common, which is the fact that they all have one pharmacist who is very conveniently located, he's easily accessible, uh, and he doesn't need an appointment. So we use that strength also allied to the competence that the pharmacist has in therapeutics and uh, the long experience in health promotion and public health. Um, and we established a partnership with the Arrhythmia Alliance in 2016 and proposed that we would work collaboratively to have more countries engaging in these events. So we invited our IPAC colleagues uh, to join the event and we had five countries joining in the first year. 
Then in the second year, we had 10 countries, and currently we have these events going on in 15 countries throughout the globe. So compared to the numbers that we've heard from the previous speakers, uh, our numbers are not that big, so we have only involved over 10,000 individuals, but it's obviously a contribution. Um, but more important than the number, I think it's the fact that, th that the ability that we've shown that we have in adapting the, um, the, the event to different venues. So we've had this held in community pharmacies, in hospitals, in nursing homes, uh, in daycare centers, um, and adapting also to the healthcare system difficulties associated with that. So in all countries, the awareness events are being very well received, and we always use a standardized procedure. So we use all the materials that were originally developed by the AFA, um, and we have uh, been helping them in translating additional materials into languages that were not covered, like Arabic, for example, or Chinese. Um, and then we offer these awareness events in pharmacies, where um, pharmacists provide information on signs and symptoms, and they make an evaluation of the patient, and then uh, take the manual pulse going through the four steps. Um, as explained in all the materials provided. So the feedback received so far is very positive. Um, but the question, in fact, was if there was a need. And I think it has already been shown that there is a need. There is international data that shows that only around 15% of GPs normally take uh, their patient's heart rhythm during the normal appointment, and it's not because they don't know how to do it, obviously, it's just because there are constraints associated with the system. Um, so there is clearly a, a, an opportunity, at least for opportunistic testing. So in more recent events, um, we've been able to use digital technology, um, and of course this is helpful for pharmacists to also feel more confident to refer the patient to the physician. So the challenge now we have is to ensure that in all countries we have efficient referral pathways um, so that all the patients identified will receive the therapy they need. And Professor Cam has already highlighted this as a problem in the UK. It's not uh, restricted to this country. But IPACT will, is, is an, uh, an organization who can offer a unique opportunity to share the learning experience we've had and we have identified good practices in many countries. So I'll just give you two quick examples. Helen Williams mentioned the ABC as a key point for more efficient um, checkup of patients. And for example, in Switzerland, they adapted the, the AF screening to include also blood pressure and cholesterol measurements. In Spain, for example, in Valencia, in a specific region, they have shared medical records where the pharmacist has uh, read and write access to these records. And this is something it doesn't exist in all countries. As far as I know, it doesn't exist in the UK. So I'll leave uh, Satiris to say how you think you can manage these challenges that we've identified. So identifying more undiagnosed cases, creating effective referral pathways, and finally use the information um, in a safe way, but also in an efficient way. Thank you. Many thanks, Philippa. Um, as Philippa suggested, I'm Satiris Antonio, I'm a consultant pharmacist based in the UK. And I'm also chair of the international pharmacist group, IPAT, that Philippa referred to. And as Philippa has already mentioned, we've been doing pulse awareness campaigns in the UK for some time. However, every time we have these type of events, World Heart Rhythm Week, we only get a handful of community pharmacies actively participating. And we're hoping to work with the Atrial Fibrillation Association as part of the next work to look at what are the enablers and the barriers for community pharmacists to get involved with Know Your Pulse campaigns. But perhaps it would be helpful in this scenario to talk a bit about some of the context with UK community pharmacies. And there's been many initiatives utilising community pharmacists in detecting high-risk individuals with certain conditions, whether that's atrial fibrillation, hypertension and diabetes. And on the whole, the evidence is beneficial in that they can identify high-risk individuals. 
And that is partly due to their known accessibility as healthcare professionals and that you can walk just down your high street and you often don't need an appointment in order for them to undertake the relevant tests. In addition, they've often been thought of as being able to address those hard to reach populations, those individuals who don't, for whatever reason, go to their GPs. However, the difficulty is often that when these initiatives have taken place, they are very rarely being commissioned as a service to support these roles in practice. And these reasons are often multifactorial and complex, and we'll touch on a bit about them now. And then hopefully we'll touch on potential some solutions. So currently, community pharmacists earn 80% of their income based on prescribing and dispensing prescriptions. And as we are a nation, we're living longer and getting older, we're getting more prescriptions such that in 2011, we had 80 million prescriptions, and in 2015, that went up to 90 million. And that's where they get the crux of their income from. So there might be a bit of a focus that we need to touch base about between undertaking prescription items to be more clinically facing orientated for a person's centre of care. Now, with the advent of online pharmacies being able to deliver medicines directly to the individual's door, then that could be a risk for high street community pharmacies. But I'd like to think of it as an opportunity for us to get them to be become more patient service facing moving forward. But that brings me to the next conundrum, and that is when we've undertaken this piece of work with community pharmacies in detecting high risk individuals, what we find is when they potentially detect someone with a possible condition, such as possible AF, we find that there's a drop in the numbers attending GPs to get that confirmation. So we need to think about the pathway to ensure that anything that we do to detect people, and you've heard this as a common theme, to ensure that the pathway gets redesigned to ensure that patients receive the relevant therapy in the case of atrial fibrillation, anticoagulant therapy. The other consideration is by the onward referral from community pharmacists to the GPs, there's a thought that what we're doing is increasing their workload and currently that's, we need to think about how we can mitigate this. So I'm pleased to say that we've been working with the Atrial Fibrillation Association and we managed to get a source of funds from NHS England, working collaboratively with Care City and run a pilot in North East London where we recruited some 20 to 30 community pharmacies using the Alive course, so digital technology and recruited people who are walking into the community pharmacist over the age of 65 and been detecting for possible atrial fibrillation. Now the first phase was that these patients or people identified as potentially high risk or possible AF, we referred them to their general practitioners and unfortunately from the initial referral to the individual receiving anticoagulant therapy took an average of three months. Now working with our patient collaboratives or collaborative partners including atrial fibrillation, we then set up to develop a one-stop atrial fibrillation clinic whereby anybody who came in to the community pharmacy over the age of 65 undertake the Alive Corps with a possible atrial fibrillation, we referred them to the One Stop AF Clinic within two weeks. And we were very keen to make it within the two weeks because I'm sure people who've got the confirmed diagnosis of atrial fibrillation, that initial period from a possible diagnosis to a confirmed diagnosis, those individuals have a level of anxiety which is completely understandable. So we were keen to refer them within two weeks. I'm pleased to say that in accordance to that, we identified or referred as part of this pilot just under 700 patients or 700 people at high risk with a confirmed possible atrial fibrillation. Sorry, let me rephrase that. We screened just under 700 people. Now of those with a possible AF, we referred them to the One Stop AF Clinic within two weeks. And in accordance with the established evidence base, we identified a confirmed atrial fibrillation to just under 2% of that group of individuals, all of which received anticoagulant therapy. In addition, there was another group of patients who had known atrial fibrillation but were not receiving anticoagulation at the time of the screening with the Alive Corps. 
And that's now been coined actionable atrial fibrillation. So there is an additional benefit from undertaking these pieces of work with the community pharmacies in that they can identify if they've got confirmed atrial fibrillation but not receiving the right therapy, they can also intervene there. So hopefully that's an example of how we are thinking of using digital technology to ensure that we have the right pathway in place to ensure that patients do receive the right therapy if we identify these high-risk individuals. So I'd just like to conclude that there is an abundance of evidence that community pharmacist-based screening interventions can be successful in identifying people with high risk of a condition such as atrial fibrillation. However, we need to think about ensuring that the pathway is in place that we don't suddenly see the drop off to those patients going to the, either the GP and we need to think about a pathway redesign and started from a blank sheet of paper to ensure that these individuals receive the appropriate therapy in a timely manner. And only by testing these different models can these be translated into a commission service. And I'll give you one example which is from a a confirmed patient now who sent me a letter, took the time out to send me a letter. And this was when she went to a community pharmacist, she told them that she kept feeling these palpitations, but for whatever reason, never went to their GP. She was so impressed with how the NHS treated her that on the way back from her shopping, on the bus back, she had a phone call from the arrhythmia nurse from the one-stop clinic telling her that she's got a confirmed appointment within that same week. And in that same week, she then got confirmed diagnosis receiving anticoagulant therapy. And I think only by working collaboratively across primary, secondary interface, and also working collaboratively with other healthcare professionals, can we ensure that we can address those 500,000 people walking around with potentially atrial fibrillation and at risk of an AF-related stroke. Thank you very much. <clears throat> My goodness, what a wealth of data evidence that we've been provided today. 16 years ago, when we hosted our first Arrhythmia Awareness Week, as it was then called, the word arrhythmia was mentioned once in the National Service Framework for Coronary Heart Disease. And yet today, we've heard from the world's leading electrophysiologist, Professor John Cam. We've heard from pharmacists representing uh, 15 countries on five continents. We've heard from NHS England, we've heard from the AHSNs, everybody coming together to make a difference. This year's World Heart Rhythm Week, we heart you, we hear you. Well, we've certainly heard enough evidence. I'm very pleased, very honored to say that all the different groups you've heard about today, whether it was SIP, whether it's the AHSNs, Arrhythmia Alliance, STARS and AF Association are represented. I sit on these committees as do others uh, in our organisation and my patient services manager. We are involved. We are at the table. They are hearing us and I'm certainly listening to them to bring about change. We've come such a long way. We've achieved so much. And I'm so proud today in this room, we have politicians, we have policy makers, we have industry. Without the medical industry, we wouldn't have all the treatments available for our patients who are here today. We have the healthcare professionals. Arrhythmia Alliance is all about collaboration. It's about representing patients, caregivers, healthcare professionals, policy makers, governments and our allied professionals, and everyone is represented today, and we've heard from them, and we're listening, and they're listening to us. The only negative is the National Screening Committee outcome. But they've written to me as a stakeholder, asking for comments, and they need those comments by the 24th of June. So we have just over two weeks to make sure that they hear us. So you've heard the evidence today. We need to make them listen to us. So my ask is, please, we're going to email you, everyone that's been here today, with a pricey of the National Sc Screening Committee uh, document, or you can have the full document if you wish. We will give you sample letters. You can write your own letter, but we urge you to write to the National Screening Committee. 
with your experiences, with your evidence, whether you're a patient, whether you're a healthcare professional, whether you're industry, let them hear. You may remember several years ago when a, a certain anti-arrhythmic uh, drug was not passed by NICE. And in force, we wrote to NICE. They received 1,300 letters and they reversed their decision. And they thanked us. Let's try and do the same with the National Screening Committee. Let's try and bring about change. I sit on the SAFER study with Jonathan Mant. Uh, I'm one of the uh, co-authors with that research. There is research going on, and I agree with John that we need this research, we need this extra evidence, but there's already enough evidence to be offering something as simple as Know Your Pulse. I would like to thank every single one of you because our simple campaign of Know Your Pulse is now taking place across the globe. When I first took Glyn's pulse and I felt his heart racing, I never knew that we would end up spreading this across the globe. I have pharmacies in New Zealand. We can't do it this week, Trudy. Can we do it in two weeks? You can do it any day of the year. Know your pulse. We can, we must, and we will bring about change. We will have screening for AF. We will make everybody aware of arrhythmias. So thank you to each and everyone for coming along today and for making a difference. You've heard us, we hear you. Now let's do something about it. Thank you, everybody.